donations as we have in the past and sign up so be available out front here pretty soon for that. So the subject again that I've been struggling with uh, and wanted to talk about today and see what you all thought about today is the idea of suffering. Now, that's great and bright and cheery on a Sunday that we talk about suffering. But we're told in Scripture that we are to share in the suffering of Christ. Turn over to Romans 8. Romans 8, 16 through 18. And then Jed asked me if I had slides, and I'm not that technologically savvy to be able to do slides, but maybe one day he'll help me develop some slides. We can put those up there. Good morning. But uh, Romans 8... 16 through 18 says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and if we're children we're heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ in if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So Paul talks about the fact that we are heirs, we are children of God, if indeed we suffer with him. That's an unusual concept, I think, for us in American culture. How many of you all like to suffer? Brandon does. Brandon loves to get out there on a hot day and run. And he lo Hotter the better, right, Brandon? Yeah, he loves that. And that's a certain type of discipline we'll talk about later. But in today's culture, American culture, we're constantly seeking comfort. We're constantly seeking just the opposite. And we're encouraged to pursue that. We love our air conditioning. We complain if it's too hot or if it's too cold. If it's not just right. We want the Goldilocks conditions. We want our soft sheets, our warm blankets, our lazy boy recliners, and the cushy the better. We, that's, that's what we strive for, right, is, is comfort, just not, not suffering. But if you look at scripture, Acts 5, 41, so they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 5, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are indeed suffering. I don't like to suffer. I don't like to be uncomfortable. I don't like to be inconvenienced. I'm annoyed when that happens. So how do we grapple with that idea? How do we struggle, struggle with that idea of sharing in his suffering? Any ideas, any thoughts, any initial? Remember too, I'm not a teacher, I'm a facilitator, which means we converse. Because I just lead things. How's he doing? Okay, keep them in your prayers. So let's, first of all, communion. Let's look at Philippians 3.10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. So each Sunday as baptized believers, we do participate and have fellowship in his crucifixion and the suffering that he endured when we partake of the Lord's Supper. So that's part of how we participate and have fellowship in the suffering of Christ. It's a weekly reminder of that pain and a weekly reminder of the suffering it took for our sins to be wiped out. And we have fellowship with God and a hope of eternal life because of it. But I don't think that's the only way that we're supposed to share in the suffering of Christ. Now, obviously, in the early church, when they heard these words, it made perfect sense to them. I mean, they were being persecuted. They were being punished uh, put to death. So hearing these words was, you know, made sense to them. And uh, unfortunately, and even in today's society or today's world, there are countries where people are being persecuted, put to death because of their faith, because of standing up for Christ. Um, so verses like Philippians 1.29, for it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer on his behalf. And of course, Revelation 2.10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. It's, it's going to happen, about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you'll be tested and have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. We're all familiar with that verse. And like I said, we think about that, and that kind of obviously rings true for us to a certain degree. But the early Christians, 
they definitely understood it. They definitely felt it. They definitely knew in parts of this world that it can hit home in a very real way. But if you're not serving as a missionary in a country somewhere that's hostile to Christianity, how else are we going to share in the sufferings of Christ? Anyone? Bueller? All right, turn over to, turn over to Mark 8, 31. Let's answer that question, or at least start to answer that question by looking at how Scripture describes Christ's sufferings and what he had to go through. So Mark 8, 31, said that he, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and by the chief priests and by the scribes and be killed and after three days would rise from the dead. So G Jesus describes that he must suffer many things and suffer rejection by the religious leaders of the time and be killed and will obviously, as we know, overcome that. So what are these many things? What is included in that term, many things that Christ said he would suffer? And how do we share in those things? Yeah, rejection. And we're going to face that and, and suffer with him uh, uh, through our standing up for him and, and our beliefs in him. But he was rejected. Yeah, he didn't come in. At times he was glorified. At times he, you know, rode in uh, on a donkey and they were praising him but then turned on him immediately. So what else? How are other ways do we suffer? How about through loss? What do we give up to be Christians? Jesus suffered loss, obviously. Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we do not see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of his suffering death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Christ did not count it a loss to give up his position in heaven right next to God. And that was a huge loss. And that's just something he suffered but gave up freely for, for, for us. Paul has a take on the things that he has lost. Philippians 3, turn over to Philippians 3, 7 through 8. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted lost because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Paul gave up a lot. He gave up prestige. He gave up his position. He gave up acceptance by the religious leaders of the time. Um, he gave up his life ultimately. But at this point, you know, Paul is looking at everything that he had and is willing and was thankful that he was able to give that up and lose that for Christ's behalf. So what are we faced with giving up? What are we faced with? What do we value the most that we sometimes have to give up to be a Christian, to follow Christ? Where are you going? Oh, okay. Yep, thank you. Yeah, so there are, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that he was, he was, he was your tempter. He was tempting you to leave and you kind of gave it up to temptation. So, so what do we, what do we, what do we grasp? What do we hold on to? What do we love? What do we not want to give up? Self-will. Self -will, okay. Very, yes. Love of self, love of what we want. We'll get to that one here in just a second. Cause that's a big one. That's the, really the crux of it. Or what? Our jobs? Do we let our jobs sometimes overtake uh, our ability to serve Christ?
Wow. 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 Gave up a job because he knew it was, yeah. So I think, I think definitely our careers and our jobs and our livelihood, we hold on to very, very, uh, and need to. I mean, we're supposed to work. We're supposed to provide. We're supposed to do those things. But if it becomes a stumbling block, if it becomes something in our way, are we willing to give that up? Are we willing to take that loss? How about your time? How valuable is your time? Do we have enough time? I don't. Never have enough time. My time is always eaten into. And it's, it's probably one of the most valuable things that I cannot control because it just keeps getting taken by bits and pieces and things that I'm just grasping onto to try to hold on to. But if I do that and don't give that up for Christ and don't give it up for the things that he needs me to do, I'm not suffering loss on his behalf. What about our finances? What about our money? What about what we contribute to his cause? Do we suffer when we give? We're supposed to be giving joyfully, obviously, so hopefully we're not suffering. Hopefully we're, we're happy about it. However, if we're not giving of our first fruits, if we're giving of our excess and not of till it hurts and stretch ourselves a little bit, is that suffering loss for Christ? Um, sometimes we just have to dig deep. And we'll be, we'll be blessed with it. Uh, Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by the standard of measure you give, it will be measured back to you in return. It's like, what, what are you using to give? How big is your cup that you're giving? And, and a contribution is part of that, but just in your daily lives that you're helping other people, that you're contributing to, to the the people who are in need around you. That's the same measuring cup that you're going to get blessed back with. So I think we need to look at how are we using the valuable things in our lives and are we willing to give those up and give those to Christ as a, as a loss and something that may hurt a little bit at first, knowing that it's going to benefit us. And as we talked about, someone said again, one of the biggest struggles that we have suffering is through the battle of our will. Probably the big, one of the biggest ones. And Jesus struggled the same way. He struggled as a human to put his father's will in front of his own will. And we don't think about that very often, but it, it did happen. Hebrews 5 eight says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered, from the things he went through that he gave up. He became obedient because of those things. God's direction in our lives is not always easy to accept. It's not always what we feel like we want or we think we deserve or what's fair in our lives. And when that happens, it can, it can conflict with what God's will is for our life. Turn over to Matthew 26, 39 through 42. Christ learned this obedience to his will, and it's, it's most evident, I think, in his prayer in the garden. There in Matthew 26. And he went a little behind, beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch for me one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not, over, do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away a second time praying, saying, My father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, I've always looked at that as he was looking at these apostles and saying, you know, I know you're wanting to and willing to be with me here and, and to, to encourage me and stay with me, but you're just weak. Your flesh is weak and you're tired and you're sleeping. You wanna... But wasn't Christ also talking about himself there? His spirit was willing, but boy, he knew what he was going to have to go through. And it was tough. And the, the agonizing thought of him having to go through that was, was, was difficult. So he agonized over that plan. He prayed if there was another option, but he said, if it's not possible, then your will be done. 
Paul had a, a, a situation where he was in torment. He was agonizing over a, a situation, the thorn in the flesh. We, we've heard it referred to. And he prayed three times for, him, for God to remove it. But ultimately, God said, know that my grace is sufficient for you. And he was able to endure whatever the suffering that that thorn in the flesh was causing. So when we have those thorns in the flesh and those struggles and those battles over our will in our lives, we've got to find a way with God's help and strength to endure through that. Even though we don't think it's the fair or the right thing to do, retrospectively, oftentimes we can look back and that and go, oh, I see. I can see now what was going on. I can see that your plan was bigger than I ever imagined. And I had to go through this in order to get to where you knew I needed to be. Jesus said it in Luke 9, 23 through 25. He was saying to them all, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake is the one who will save it. For what does it good, what good does it do if a person gains the whole world but forfeits himself or his soul? And that's kind of what Brandon was saying. The whole world is not worth giving up our soul. So to deny ourselves, we suffer a loss. We suffer that loss of what we think we want, what we think the direction should be in deference of what God thinks and what he wants our, our life to be. And Paul found the, that situation and how he found strength to endure in Philippians 4, 11, 13, which we're all familiar with. Not that I speak from need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I have. I know how to get along with little. I know how to get along in prosperity. In each and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And in verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So when we get into those situations of battle of will, where we think we want this, but God gives us that, we, we submit to his will knowing he can get that, us through those things. He can, he can provide in every way. So when we go through those situations, we find it, again, difficult and hard. But there's a process that we go through. There's a process of growth that we go through that. So we find oftentimes that we, that we suffer with Christ through the discipline that he's using to grow us, to make us stronger, to get, you know. Like I was saying with Brandon, he loves getting out there and running or did out there in the heat. We, we see people working out all the time and lifting heavy weights and running and doing all this CrossFit and trying to get stronger, and it's a struggle. And it hurts to do that stuff. And we have to push. Uh, I told to my boys one time, one of the best things I ever did in life to get me prepared for life was running cross-country. When you run like that and you push yourself, you have to deny the fact that your legs are burning, your lungs are hurting, you just want to stop, but you know there's a goal that you're trying to reach. And so you push yourself beyond what you think you should do. You put your will above what your body wants you to do. And in suffering through discipline, there's trials that we go through that are very taxing to us, very challenging to us mentally and physically and spiritually and sometimes it's not hard to understand why we're going through those things turn over to hebrews 12 7 through 11 where the hebrew writer talks about discipline and how we benefit from that he says it is for discipline that you endure god deals with you as with sons for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not more be subjected to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as they seem best to them. But he disciplines us for good, that we may be able to share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems not to be pleasant. There comes the suffering aspect of it, but painful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. And as we talked about earlier in Hebrews 5, 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience to the things that he suffered. So what, are, what ways do we discipline ourselves and grow spiritually? We already talked about the fact that we don't like pain. We don't like suffering. We don't like to hurt. 
But how do we discipline ourselves spiritually? Wait, 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 wait. Not all at the same time. Just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Just raise your hand. Is that easy to do? What forces are there trying to replace that? <laughs> Everything. Well, she said basically we have to put our mind, place our mind on things above, on not the the fight and the the, the political battles and the uh, wars and all the things that are going on in this world. We know that the, the wars aren't of flesh and blood; they're of the principalities and authorities and the spiritual realm that are being fought for us. Is that easy to do? How many of you all find it very easy to stay reading scripture on a regular basis? And It can be tough at times. Because again, the world creeps in. You have to be disciplined, going back to that, what we said. You have to have a discipline about you. We have no problems getting up at 5 in the morning and, and again, going to the gym and exercising or disciplining ourselves by a certain diet we're going to be strict about. Oops. We're going to be strict about and not, you know, veer off of that and make ourselves suffer by not taking that piece of cake or that cookie or eating the stuff we don't like. We can do those things. But to have a regular diet of Scripture... To have a regular diet of God in prayer and in scripture and in, in uh, small group discussion and things we get together with each other, that's we find harder to do for some reason because the world, the world creeps in. How about, how many of you all fast? Oh, that, why would we fast? Why would you, why would you not feed yourself when you get hungry. Of course, Jesus says when you fast, not if you fast. What is fasting all about? What's the purpose of that? You ever thought about that? Giving something up? Giving what up? Right? Yeah, the one that Jesus talks about in Matthew 6, whenever you, whenever you fast, not, not if you fast, now whenever you fast, do not make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do because they're distorting their face. They want to be noticed by people that they're holy because they're fasting. Uh, truly, they'll have their reward. Fasting, and I'm convinced we still need to be doing this, it's an exercise in putting our will to what we would hopefully want spiritually ahead of the needs of the flesh. Who fasted but the longest that you can think of? Jesus, 40 days. Why did he do that? What was he getting ready to do? He fasted 40 days in the desert, and then what happened? He was tempted by Satan, so he knew that was coming up. What did he do to prepare himself for that? He fasted for 40 days. What would we do if we knew we were getting ready to meet Satan, mano a mano, head on? We'd go to the all-you-can-eat buffet, I'm convinced. Right? We'd want to beef up. We wouldn't fast. But fasting is an exercise in discipline. Fasting is what we do to put our fleshly needs behind what, we, what our will is, what we hope our will is. So that when that temptation comes, not just with food, but with sin of a fleshly nature, we have exercised that will. We have strengthened that will. Because we, we don't want to deny ourselves. What I want, I want. But you have to be able to have had that experience before a challenge comes up. You have to be able to have trained and exercised and disciplined yourself to not give in to the fleshly needs and the fleshly lusts when it happens. Because your, your strength of your will, your ability to, to avoid temptation or not to avoid temptation because it's going to be out there, but to give in to temptation is going to be weakened. 
Um, turn over to Romans 8, 5 through 10. For those who are in accord with the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are in accord with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, if you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Christ denied himself. He learned obedience through his suffering, and we have to strive to do the same. And again, the world is attacking us constantly. Um, there's no avenue that we have access to, uh, social media, the news, the internet, friends, family, that aren't going to have some influence or attempt to have some influence on our spirituality and our attempt to turn our backs on Christ. So the other, another way that, that uh, suffering for Christ is very evident in Scripture uh, and obviously with Christ and needs to be with us is suffering for the gospel. In Mark 8, 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests. We talked about that and be killed. He was rejected by the, the religious leaders. The good news he was trying to bring was, was denied, was, was rejected. Um, and Jesus said himself in John 4, 44, he testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. We are in a hostile environment in this country towards Christianity. If, you ha if you've seen the numbers of Christians dwindling in, in this country, if you've seen the increase in attacks on anything that we um, claim to, to hold dear to in our Christian faith, every year it's getting worse and worse. And you will find yourself in that situation. There's no doubt in my mind, if you haven't already, and I'm sure most of you all have, you will have a situation where you have to stand up boldly to defend Christ against friends and family, society that's telling you you're doing wrong. And Isaiah predicted this. He predicted the times we're in in Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Aren't we there? Does that sound familiar? I mean, everything it pops up in the news today and in social justice uh, discussions it's like where where did this come from where in the world is this going and more and more you see people discussing the fact that it's just evil it's strictly evil that's trying to tell you that right is wrong that white is black that bitter is sweet I mean it's it's uh, it's out there right now we're in the midst of this battle big time so it's gonna happen you're gonna be belittled you're gonna be criticized you're going to be ostracized, and you're going to be made to suffer for standing up for what's right. And that's part of suffering for Christ, for the gospel, for standing firm. One of the things that I, that I think we oftentimes overlook, too, as far as our sharing in the suffering of Christ is through temptation, as we talked about earlier. In Hebrews 2.18, the writer says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered... He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And later in chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but the one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. So one of the ways that Jesus suffered as a man was to be tempted to sin, but never gave in to that temptation. Turn over to the, uh, the temptation of Christ in, in Luke. Luke 4, 1 through 13. 
Because this is what we think about. When we think of Christ's temptation, Jesus being tempted, we always think about the in the wilderness meeting Satan and how he overcame that. So in verse Luke 4, verse 1, Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness and be, for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during that time. And when he had, it, they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And he led him to the, up to the, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I'll give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever I want. Therefore, if you worship me before me, it shall be yours. And Jesus replied, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and had him stand at the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against the stone. But Jesus said to him, It has been stated, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And in verse 13, So when the devil had finished every temptation, he left them until an opportune time. So we think about, well, this is when Christ was tempted, right? These 40 days and these, these situations and uh, tempted by uh, lust of the flesh, by wanting, by you know, giving in to his hunger, didn't do that. Uh, that was a pride of life where he could have gotten everything um, that he needed right there and bypassed the cross because Satan could have given it to him, uh, short, you know, short-circuiting the process. He didn't do that. And then, as we said before, he was rejected he was um, uh, not accepted and and he said this will prove right here if you can, if you cast yourself down that it'll prove that you're that you're God so God he overcame all these temptations but we know that wasn't the end that wasn't when Satan stopped ever tempting him again he said he left until an opportune time he kept coming back he kept for the 33 years that he was on this earth from the age of accountability to his death Satan was constantly tempting him and we know because of the fact that he was a sinless man and he had to do that because of if not he could not have been our perfect sacrifice that was the only reason he was able to take our place if he had sinned if he had been sinful he would have been in there with us and needed someone to redeem him so the suffering that he went through each and every day being tempted but overcoming that temptation was a suffering that we can share in because we're tempted each and every day and every day we are able to through his power overcome that temptation and turn away from that that sin we are sharing in his suffering because it is suffering we're not tempted with things that we don't like i'm not tempted by the same things you all are tempted by Satan knows what your, what your weaknesses are, knows what my weaknesses are. I tell the, the uh, youth group, it's kind of like, um, like a fisherman going out here to the lake, and he's got his, his box of lures, and he opens it up, and he's got one lure, and he just keeps casting that same lure over and over again. He's not going to do that. You, who's a, who fishes in here? Anybody fish? How many lures do you have in your box? <laughs> there's a temptation right there right a temptation to go i went with a guy one time he didn't have lures he had different rods and you might have that too he had different rod and reel setups with different lures so you wouldn't have even have to take the time to just pick up this rod and pick up that one and, and toss that one because satan does the same thing he's got a whole box of lures they're all very flashy they're all very colorful they're all very very appetizing looking and he knows which one he can put in front of you to make you look and to make you desire. And even though we know that that lure's got a hook in it, we sometimes take the big bite and he's got us. So don't think that, that when you're going through life and you're going through temptation and you're struggling with that, that you're alone. We're all going through it together and that's something that we all have to face. But we can do it with, with the help of, of God. We can do it with uh, his strength and his, his uh, intervention. We oftentimes told the boys as they were growing up, the right choice to make is not always the easiest choice. 
And when you're faced with those choices to make, again, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be struggles, there's going to be maybe negative consequences at the time to a decision that you made. But if it's the right choice, you need to go ahead and do that. Um, so in Philippians 3.10, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings to be conformed to his death. That confirmation or conforming to his death, as we talked about before, is that death of the old man, that burial and baptism to rise again. Um, but the death of the old man is the death of the person who pleases himself and tries to make those decisions based on what he wants and not what God wants us to do. Um, that's not easy to do. So each one of these things that we go through in life, each time that we struggle, each time we suffer to, to overcome our will, to overcome what the, the world wants us to do, to overcome temptation, to overcome the, the challenge of standing up for the gospel, those are the times in our lives that we are sharing, I think, with the sufferings of Christ um, and being a fellowship and a participation in his, his death and his, his struggles. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I had thought about uh, over the past few weeks and the things that I've been struggling with and, and trying to figure out. Any comments, questions? Dan said I didn't have to go to 8.15. He said I could stop early if I needed to. Um, and just keep in mind, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, 9. So resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers and sisters who are in the world. We're not in this alone. This is happening to all of us. And that's why we are a congregation. That's why we are a church. That's why we are a family is to share in these sufferings and share in these things together. So when we go through these trials and difficulties, we've got somebody that's gone through it before that we can talk to, that we can go to, that we can have comfort with, that we can have encouragement with, uh, and that we are not alone in this, in this battle that we're in. Uh, because it's not easy, and we all struggle, and we all have our, our diff difficulties that we go through. And by the time I'm struggling, it may not be the time you are, and vice versa. So we're here to help each other and help each other up and help each other to heaven. All right, let's, let's finish in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you love us. We're so thankful that you know our struggles. We're so thankful that you know and that you sent your son to know what we go through. As he was tempted as we are, as he struggled as we do, uh, he knows exactly what we're faced with. And he overcame, and we're so thankful for that. Father, we pray that you will be with those who are struggling. Uh, be with Dustin as he struggles with this medical condition, that you will heal him. Be with those who are struggling with loss, with depression. Be with those who are struggling with addiction, and those who are struggling with spir their spirituality, that they may know you, that your will will be in their lives, uh, and they will be able to overcome. And we pray all these things, Father, through your Son's holy name.